I'm going to go ahead with the meeting beginning ritual. 起立，面向佛堂，参加三鞠躬、一鞠躬、再鞠躬、三鞠躬，参加各位点传师一鞠躬，开班一鞠躬，请坐下。Please be seated. So, if you guys recall, the original question was, can one follow the Tao in a secular path? No gods, no temples. That was the original question. So, quite naturally, one of the follow-up questions was about the Iguandao approach to deities. So, there's a, a bunch of deities that people venerate in Iguandao. So, if it is possible to practice the Tao without these gods, then uh, how do people, um, you know, worship these gods? Uh, how do people pray to them, etc.? What is the approach? So let me pull up that question. What is the Iguandao approach to gods? And here's the answer. So because we have so many questions, uh, we have three questions this time, uh, I'm going to try to keep the answer as brief as possible. So the short answer is that it, it does vary because people come into the Tao at different levels in their spiritual understanding. So there's definitely people in Iguandao who are in what Bill and I call the transaction mode. What is that? That means, that means sort of like you going to a vending machine or maybe walking into 7-Eleven to buy something. Your interaction with the deities become like a transaction. Like, oh God, I promise to be good. I'll be a good boy. If you help me with X, Y, Z, if you protect me, if you give me your blessings, etc. So that when you actually look deeper into it, you you would have to admit that the whole scheme is a little bit ludicrous because you are assuming that whoever, whatever deity you are praying to, is automatically agreeing to the deal. Well, do you really know that for a fact? What if God or a particular deity is thinking, what, for in exchange for two weeks of good behavior, you want me to help you win the lottery? I'm not going to do that, you know? So it's possible that the deity may not agree to the transaction, but of course, the assumption is always rather one-sided. So, um, for people in that transaction mode, the purpose of worship and prayer is just to, you know, request divine protection and favors. You know, particular God will help me pass this exam that's coming up, or, you know, help me get a girlfriend or something like that. You know, whatever the request may be, uh, it's all transactions. But that's, uh, that, that doesn't cover everybody in Iguandao because the idea in cultivating the Tao is that you have to understand more, you have to figure out more about life, and then use that knowledge to help you become a better person, more spiritually attuned, and wiser. So, at a higher level, you begin to understand how to create your own destiny. Walking the path correctly brings good things to life naturally. Like, you don't have to force it. You don't have to, this will, this will happen even if you pray to no gods. Because the Tao is impersonal, because the Tao is like a natural law, if you follow the path correctly, good things will happen to you in your life, as if the deities are granting you your request and providing you with protection. So, when you get to that level of understanding, realize that you don't have to force a transaction on a particular deity. You just have to stick to your path. You just have to do what you know to be right. Then, these gods take on a different role. No longer the vending machine, no longer the 7-Eleven where you go and buy your coffee and your pastries and whatnot. The gods become avatars of virtues that you wish to cultivate for yourself. 
So at this point, I want to I want to ask uh, Bill to also uh, provide some input because this is probably one of the questions that he gets asked most often. It, it, it is, and, and be, believe it or not, you just granted me two pieces of spiritual understanding. <laughs> I know why I can't get a girlfriend, and I need to go to 7-Eleven more often. Ah, okay. Glad, glad to help. My, my work is Actually, done. I, I, I love that, that explanation that you use. It, it's wonderful and, and so precise. The, the, the thing is, and, and I catch myself doing this too, it, it's so easy to, to personify the Tao because it acts almost as if it were intelligent. You know, it, 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 what I tell people is if they're expecting to find a God that kind of looks like Santa Claus with a shepherd's crook saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant, I think they're going to be disappointed. But still, we look at the various peerages of the Tao with names and labels that we can comprehend. You know, we talk about Lao Mu, which is the, the nurturing aspect, or Wu Ji, the void, or uh, the Tao itself is the, the provider of, of everything that we need. And although the Tao itself couldn't care less, um, it's still much easier for us to comprehend something that we can stick a label on, and human beings have done that since the beginning of, of time. Um, I, I tell people that, that I personally do not believe in a personified God, even though I talk about the Tao in, in personified terms. Um, I, I should probably try to do a better job of not doing that. But that not that notwithstanding, um, we all kind of need something to hook our faith into. And, and most people here in America have grown up in that in that concept or learning of eternal glorification or punishment of heaven and hell and God and Satan that you kind of have to relate it to something at least to help them to understand you know what most likely is not there I practice the Yiguan Dao teachings the teachings of Lao Tzu as my religion I, I don't have a personified God at the end of my of my spiritual practice somewhere but yet I, I, I still do the rituals in front of the figurines of the Buddhas and Bodhisattva because they represent the, the virtues that I'm trying to, to emulate and become. Does that, does that make sense? Yep, sounds good to me. And I think, you know, it makes it more real to people, uh, Bill, when you tell them about how you personally approach this particular question. Like this is what you do every single day. Yes. So... Uh, let me share with everyone a couple of examples of these uh, deities that are avatars of the virtues that one wishes to cultivate. Uh, I have two examples. That's, uh, that's all I have from truedoubt.org. So we'll go through them quickly and then, um, and then we'll move on to the next question. Uh, and I uh, hope you don't mind, Bill, but after we're done with this question, I'll go ahead and mute your your phone uh, to uh, prevent any any accidental sounds uh, from disrupting. Now, if it's okay with you, I need to I need to bail here. My my wife and daughter just took off for Virginia, and I have to deliver Aaron to college. <laughs> hey, that's uh, that's serious business. So we'll uh, we'll talk to you again next next Sunday. Uh, thank you so very much. Alrighty. So let's uh, let's move on. Uh, I have a couple of examples to share with everyone. Uh, this is from TrueDao.org. So this example is the Maitreya Buddha. So as I said, these become symbols or avatars or representations of virtues that you wish to cultivate for yourself. 
with Maitreya Buddha, uh, this is also, um, like I mentioned, I have two examples up on TrueDao.org. I know that there should be more. In time, there will be more. At least there's now the framework uh, for me to, to fill out. But let's stick to Maitreya Buddha for a moment. When you see this image, you know, you probably say, oh yeah, that's the, that's the fat Buddha, that's the Buddha, that's the laughing Buddha, etc. That's the happy Buddha. So, this image is nine times out of ten in the West is confused with the Buddha. And no, you might say that, well, well wait a minute, I thought, I, just, I thought you just said that this is the Buddha. No, no, this is the Maitreya Buddha. The Maitreya Buddha is a different entity from the Buddha. The image of the Maitreya Buddha comes from a historical figure in China, a monk. Uh, the, the Chinese at the time knew him as Bu Dai He Shang, which means the monk with the cloth bag because this uh, this portly figure in ancient China always, you know, walked around with this bag full of goodies, you know, sort of like the ancient Chinese Santa Claus, if you will. So, Bu Dai He Shang, when he passed away on his deathbed, he said he revealed that, well, um, I may, as, I may as well tell you guys the truth, I'm actually the manifestation of the Maitreya Buddha, so I came into the mortal realm to basically check out how everybody's doing, so I'm gonna, gonna take off now, catch you guys later. Well, he didn't actually say that, but I'm paraphrasing. So, the idea caught on for the Chinese, and this is a, a historical figure from hundreds of years ago, the, the idea caught on because the the character, the essence of the Chinese is a very happy-go-lucky, very optimistic, very cheerful, upbeat, positive kind of mentality. So they latched on to this image of this fat and happy Maitreya Buddha. Prior to the cloth bag monk, the image of the Maitreya Buddha was a skinny dude. So figurines, statues, drawings, paintings proliferated since that time depicting the Maitreya Buddha as this big, happy, portly fellow. That's how we ended up with all these Chinese-owned businesses that have the, like a, a little statue of the Maitreya Buddha somewhere with incense around it, you know, for good luck, because the, the, the size, the girth of the Maitreya Buddha is symbolic of the good life, meaning prosperity and abundance. So businesses, business owners want to have the figure of the Maitreya Buddha there to bring, to help bring good luck to the business. Now, as the, as the Chinese people emigrated out to all corners of the world doing businesses in different countries, sometimes they open up a Chinese restaurant um, in the United States, it's because the law forbids them to be business owners at, at, at one point, so they could, they could only get into the businesses that they could get into, and that, in, that included uh, restaurants and, and, and laundromats. So they, they, would, they would always have the Maitreya Buddha with them, so the image proliferated in the West as well, leading people to point to that and say, oh, that's the Buddha. And also keep in mind that these these uh, the Chinese people themselves, they may not be schooled on the history of Buddhism. So they themselves may point to the figure figurine of the Maitreya Buddha and say, oh yeah, that's that's the Buddha. That we worship the Buddha, that's the Buddha right there. So that perpetuates the misconception even further. <coughs> so the actual Buddha, the founder of Buddhism, uh, was not a portly Chinese monk from hundreds of years ago. He was a skinny um, Indian prince from more than 2,000 years ago, from 2,500 years ago. 
So a completely different person. So now you know, uh, by virtue of uh, this webinar, that what people point to as the Buddha is in fact the Maitreya Buddha. The Maitreya Buddha in Buddhism is said to be the Buddha of the prophecy. That is, there are prophecies, you may not know this, but there are prophecies in Buddhism that says that foretell the coming of the Maitreya Buddha at a future time to spread Buddhism across the land. So, yeah, so he was uh, here once before in ancient China as a big fat dude, and then he's going to come again at some point, maybe in a different guise. And indeed, there are many people across the world, around the world, people claim to be the Maitreya Buddha, and they create like a cult, a personality, a, uh, like a Maitreya Buddha Buddhism sect, and they attract many followers. The reason why there's uh, still that going on is because people do have a thirst for spiritual leadership. Anyhow, there's a lot more details that you can read about that in TrueDoubt.org. The, the uh, symbolic significance of Maitreya Buddha is the, is the happiness, uh, and that happiness is a result of the key characteristics of the Maitreya Buddha. The key characteristics are generosity and tolerance. So it is said, uh, the Chinese expression is du da nen rong, which means big stomach can contain, can contain things. That's, a, that's an expression, uh, sort of like we say, you know, someone has a big heart. That's an expression, meaning that someone is very tolerant of dissenting views, other perspectives, um, you know, live and let live kind of idea. So when you are able to practice tolerance of people who are different from you, that leads to happiness. And generosity, same thing. When you are able to give to others, there's, there's a, that's a source of joy. So, uh, and people like dealing with these Chinese business owners uh, that have the Maitreya Buddha because invariably they deliver more value uh, than is asked for them. They deliver beyond expectations, and that's what uh, that's the secret ingredient for the success that they they enjoy. Not really such a secret after all. It's just uh, it's just good business practice, and it's all embodied in the statue of the Maitreya Buddha. So remember, if you want to have more of that cultivated generosity, happiness of spirit, that tolerance of other people, then this is a great deity to keep in mind, uh, especially as you go through uh, the rituals. Uh, this is uh, an ultimate key to happiness. Let's talk about my second example. Like I mentioned, I have only a grand total of two in TrueDoubt.org. So this is the other one. <clears throat> so this is Guan Shen Di Jun. That's the formal title. Uh, the this man, also a historical figure, uh, originally was known as Guan Yu, where Guan is the family name, the surname Yu is the given name. So he was a uh, he was the um, the most uh, powerful, the ultimate warrior from uh, Chinese history during the time of the Three Kingdoms, and he uh, later on became uh, like a saint, like a patron saint for martial arts practitioners everywhere. So even today, he is revered uh, by people who study uh, Wu Shu or Chinese Kung Fu, and in Iquan Dao, he's also uh, a figure that is very well known and revered, and it's because of the, of the virtues that he embodies, which include honor, uh, loyalty, integrity, justice, courage, and strength. So you can, as you can see in my slide down here. So those that wish to cultivate courage can look to 
this particular deity to remind themselves that you know in order to uh, to speak to act with courage one must have conviction the conviction that that Guan Sun Di Jun had at the time that he was alive was that he would fight in the war, the war of the three kingdoms, in order to promote peace and protect the people, protect civilization. He wanted to bring an end to war. So he was the ultimate warrior because he fought for peace. The only reason why he would fight at all was to bring about peace and prosperity so nobody will have to fight anymore. So the ultimate warrior was the warrior who would seek an end to warfare. So aside from that, he demonstrated uh, you know, his integrity, his honesty, his character with, with everything that he did. Uh, so in addition to being like a total badass on the battlefield, uh, he, was a, he was someone that people knew they could, they could count on 100%. Uh, because of how powerful he was as a warrior, you know, the different lords of the Three Kingdoms period wanted to recruit him. But he, he has sworn his loyalty to only one particular faction, and that was the faction that he felt would be best for, for the people. So the saga of the Three Kingdoms, very dramatic, and there are still quite a few movies that are made for that. Uh, I would encourage you to look deeper into it. I think you will find it entertaining. And you will also find in Guan Sun Di Jun uh, a very useful reminder for modern life. As we go about living day to day, it's oftentimes very useful to remind ourselves that we need to embody more of the honor that, that he demonstrated. So this is the other uh, this is the other deity. Um, so two examples for the Yiguan Dao approach to deities. Now let's move on. Let's go ahead and do the meeting ending ritual, everybody. Qi Well done, everybody. Thank you so much.